Ken Wiley is an internationally certified mountain guide and the founder of Mountains for Growth, an organization that uses mountain climbing and the outdoors to help people overcome frustration, trauma, and low self-worth. His story illustrates the facing of incredibly difficult situations and coming out the other side. With adventure as his guru, he connects himself and others to the deeper wisdom of nature. And this was in 2003, the, the operation that I was working for, we flew in by helicopter and would ski tour human powered ascents of peaks um, for a week. And then, um, then the week would wrap up with a flight out. So um, it's a kind of a hol backcountry holiday where we ski, backcountry ski and ski up peaks and ski down. And um, I was pretty excited to be in that position. I, um, I would have to say that at the time I perceived that I had a charmed life, but um, I didn't always perceive that. The third week of my work at this particular lodge, I had lots of experience. I was 30 year, 38 years old at the time, um, but I was working as an apprentice ski guide and the guy I was working for was, was was perfectly designed to challenge me. I see it that way. The summer before working at this operation, I asked for a mentor, and I wasn't really asked the universe for a mentor, and it wasn't really specific. So I got, a, I got the perfect mentor for me. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it was an easy, easy relationship. To encapsulate the story of this tragic event, we were caught in an avalanche. Half of the lead guides group and all of my group, 13 of us, buried in snow. I was under the snow for 45 minutes. And, and interestingly, it felt comfortable to me. It felt comfortable to be buried. Um, and it took me a long time to make sense of that experience. Of the 13 people that were buried, only six were recovered. And seven, seven people perished that day. Four people from the lead guides group and three people from my group. So three people that I was being paid to take care of were killed that day. And, um, and interestingly, one of them that died spoke to me very clearly and he said, I don't like this situation, I don't think it's a very safe situation. I said, neither do I. And that little exchange for me ended up being something extremely important about my human journey. I was, as I mentioned, I was buried for 45 minutes. For a long time, I, I, I perceived that I was buried for 30 minutes. But then, 12 years after the event, I talked to the people who dug me out, and they said, no, you were under for 45 minutes. I remember being dug out of the snow, and I remember being slapped across the face and being told to wake up. I was, um, I was healthy when I was dug out. I didn't have a scratch on me wasn't injured in, in any way, shape, or physically injured in any way, shape, or form. But I just wanted to get out of there. I didn't, I didn't want to know what was happening with anybody else. I just wanted to run. And I think that for me that was uh, in part, part of a pattern. It was um, when difficult things happen, I'd disappear. And I was loaded into a helicopter and flown out of the chaotic situation and then I was in the you know, hospital bed for a few hours that, as they rewarmed me from somewhat hypothermic and I went home that night. Mm. Um, and it was unbelievably stressful because this was something that I couldn't run from. That we had clients from Europe, from the United States, uh, from Canada. There were seven fatalities, and it was in, in the front page of papers across North America and in Europe, and it was everywhere. There was nowhere to hide from this event. 
And the internet was just, uh, and, you know, of course the internet started in, to become part of our, our social structure in the 1990s. By 2003, there was websites that, you know, were dedicated to different things. And I remember at the time there was a website dedicated to backcountry skiing called Telemark Tips. Telemark skiing is kind of a version of backcountry skiing where you always have a free heel. And there was a continual stream of people's opinions and, and judgments about what happened. And it was really difficult, um, extremely difficult. And now I'd actually agree with most of those judgments. Um, yes, we were foolish. Yes, we were being dumb. Yes, we were doing a whole bunch of things wrong. And, uh, you know, I'm not lost on the, um, on the, the shape of the table today. Um, it forms a why. And for me, for very many years, I, I asked the question, why? Why did this happen? Why did it happen to me? One of the things that... Um, um, as a guide, I always assumed that if something bad was going to happen in the mountains, that it would happen to me. And I wouldn't have to live with the consequences. I always assumed that if there was an avalanche, I'd be killed in it. And, but um, one of the things that I'd never calculated was that people I was meant to be taking care of would be killed and I'd be around to survive the consequences. As a young adventurer, I think that I, um, I went to the mountains to escape. You know, it was the perfect escape from perhaps painful situations growing up. And, and, um, and I got to be free. got to make choices and do things and have adventures. And, and I felt profoundly not free after this avalanche event. But I think for many years I, I just kind of put it aside and kept 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 on as best as I could and and um, and I would now say that um, the event owned me for a long time. The event owned me. Yeah, it owned me. I was bothered by it, but I didn't know what to do with it. And, I, and on some level, I knew that I needed to learn from it, but I didn't know how or why or you know what I, what I needed to what I, what was I supposed to do with this thing, this tragic event? When I, I went to school at the University of Calgary and I studied outdoor pursuits, at the time they, the University of Calgary in the phys ed department, physical education department, they had uh, you could get a phys ed degree with an outdoor pursuits route. So instead of dribbling basketballs and playing volleyball, we went rock climbing and mountaineering and paddling on the rivers. Um, that was a really great thing. And, and, you know, that was part of my perception of this charmed life that I was living. And I remember being 21 years old and, and the professor saying to us, I want, he said, I want you to write down a philosophy for what you do. And I was like, why, would, why on earth would I write a philosophy of this? What would this serve? You know, I just wanted to escape to the mountains. I didn't want to have any philosophies or think anything deep about anything that I was doing. Like, I just wanted to get away from it all. But I also wanted to make it my career. But I did the assignment, and I remember uh, writing that I want the mountains to be, to be educated for myself and those that I lead. And I remember many years after the avalanche tragedy, this philosophical statement coming back to me. And I realized in a profound way that I needed to learn from it. I needed to take the um, humble approach and, and figure out what I needed to learn from it. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm going to learn all the, about all the technical ways that we made mistakes. That was pretty safe. I didn't actually have to think about how I contributed to the event but I could just think of all the technical things. And that took me a little ways. I gave some talks on all the technical mistakes to my, my colleagues in, in the industry. And um, that was interesting. But I was still bothered by this, this question, why? Why did this happen? What were the things that led us into this? 
And I knew I needed to kind of delve into that a little bit, but I just carried on with life and carried on. And eventually my health started to suffer. I was carrying this event and it was in the, the guilt and the, the things that, um, that the, the question of why seemed, seemed to elude me, but it was still a big weight, a huge weight. And eventually my health su suffered dramatically. All of my joints started aching. I had a frozen right shoulder. And then my back went out and I landed on my home office floor. And the words, okay, all right, came out of me. And I don't know where they came from. I had this idea that there was this being, this greater being with a pin with the voodoo doll of me that kept putting pins in until I would listen. <laughs> and the, the, when, when the, one, the pin went into my back, <laughs> that was the, the thing that broke the, broke the ice and I decided, okay, I, needed, I need to write about this. So I sat down and I wrote for a year. And after the first year of writing, I thought I had something that might be the semblance of a book, and it got me into a writing program. And in the, in the writing, I started to discover a whole bunch of stories about lessons that the mountains were trying to teach me, but I wasn't paying attention. And I didn't know exactly what these stories had to do with the avalanche, but they, I was starting to link them. And at the writing program, they said, well, you have a really great story about adventure and an avalanche, but you should start over. And so I sat down and I wrote for another year. And after another year, I got a publisher. They said, well, you've got a really great story about an avalanche, but you have to start over. So I sat down and I wrote for a third year. And one of the things that happened over those three years was the story changed from being a story about an avalanche to being a story about my own growth as a human being. And so when I tell a story about an avalanche, it's like, yeah, I was buried. I was buried in an avalanche. And that's what it started out to be was I was buried as an av in an avalanche and seven people were killed. And then when I published the book, Buried, the title of the book taught me that I was buried as a human being long before any snow slid. I wasn't living authentically. I wasn't speaking my truth. A couple of days before the avalanche happened, I, I, um, I, didn't have, I didn't get any sleep. I knew that the snow conditions were such that it was crazy for us to be going to the terrain that we were going to. What had happened that year was that it had snowed in October and early November, and then it rained right up to the mountain tops and it created an ice layer about this thick and then then it snowed for the rest of November and December and into January so there was about two meters of snow on top of this ice layer and I knew all of this before we went on to the big slopes that we were skiing and um, and the challenge was for me my life journey was to stand up and speak my truth about what I knew about the snow. But the guy I was working for, I found incredibly intimidating. I was terrified by him. Absolutely mort morally terrified by him. But when I look at it today, I ask myself, so what could he do to me? <coughs> what really could he do to me? He could fire me. Today, I would actually say, wow, you know, being fired is probably a pretty small consequence 
than the actual consequence that played out. <clears throat> the journey was a really, um, um, the journey of writing was a really powerful one. And what I discovered was that uh, my life of adventure was teaching me these lessons long before any snow slid. And if I had have paid attention to the lessons, then I probably could have avoided being buried and I could have avoided being responsible for people losing their lives. The first um, lesson was about courage and I see the, the word courage. Where does your courage come from? I'd always assumed that I was, since I was doing difficult things in the mountains, climbing difficult peaks and skiing difficult lines, I always assumed that I was courageous. But in the writing, and um, I discovered a story where I was um, afraid to tell a climbing partner that I was too tired to carry on. So I ended up in a near epic situation where I, and where I simply ended up being scared and angry. And when that story emerged in the writing, I realized, oh, I've been struggling with real courage for a long time. I made the assumption that I was courageous because I was doing things that might lead to physical consequences. But I, did, I found out that I wasn't very socially courageous. I wasn't willing to speak to the truths of situations and then um, have people disagree with me and live the consequences of those disagreements. Interestingly, um, because I was afraid to speak my truth, I kept finding myself in situations where um, I wasn't surrounded by people who were supportive. Um, because I would agree, I, would, I was um, always in situations where people weren't interested in listening to what I had to say. Funny how in learning to speak my truth, it's been about learning to listen to myself. So that was one lesson that came from, um, from the writing, was what true courage is. And for me, it's been about um, discovering my social courage, being able to speak up. The other lesson was about connection. Connection to myself and the environment and other people. I was willing to put myself, make myself vulnerable in, in, um, in mountain situations, but I wasn't willing to be vulnerable in social situations. And we now know, or I now know, that vulnerability is the thing that connects. And in part, that's why I'm here today, is to you know, tell a story about vulnerability, how it connects or has connected me to my humanity. I often speak about the avalanche, but it's more about speaking about the, the human journey that I've gone on through the process of something profoundly tragic. One of the more challenging pieces for me to do was to go to as many family members as, as, um, as I could and sit down with them and say, I didn't take care, good care of your loved one that day. But what I was met with was compassion. And, um, you know, that's perhaps one of, the, one of the big lessons is when I stepped forward and presented my humanity, I was met with compassion. <laughs>